All right. Okay. All right. I see people trickling in. Um, as we are trickling in, um, I will quickly introduce myself. Uh, I am Freddie. I am a PhD candidate at, at the University of British Columbia, the Department of Experimental Medicine. And I work with uh, Dr. Amy Mangus and working out of the BC Center for Disease Control. And my project revolves around um, antimicrobial resistance, uh, to put it in short. Um, so hi from me, and I'm part of a trainee of the DASH cluster as well. Um, so I am honored to be here to welcome you all to today's talk. Um, so as we were just trickling in, we'll give it a couple of minutes, uh, maybe just to get the uh, lunch juices flowing if you're in Vancouver and if you're tuning in from somewhere else, um, <laughs> uh, whatever time it is there. Uh, maybe you can say where you're from in the chat and maybe uh, add on yeah, what was the last uh, bio slash health informatic tool that you used, or if you're not in bio or health, um, any other informatic tool that you recently used uh, before hopping onto this call. Or the last movie you saw. <laughs> Amazing. Station 11. Hmm, never heard of that one. Ooh, Encanto. It was actually also the last movie I saw. Dan from Van R classic. Ooh, hello from Atlanta. I heard Eternals was awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wasn't great. <laughs> All right, no, we'll not put that on my list. But uh, I can, I think Lucas can maybe also add in. Um, Encanto was amazing. I really enjoyed it. Don't get me start singing now. <laughs> hey, that might not be a. I would. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give it uh another 30 seconds or so before we um start but for those who are coming in we're just throwing in the chat where we're from um what you know last informatic tool you used and what last what it was the last movie you watched so feel free to add to the chat Okay. Hi, Jacob from Portland. Oh, don't look up. Amazing. All right, I think we'll, we'll get to it. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for tuning in um, and continuing to post your um, movies and uh, your tools and your location. So welcome from everywhere. Um, as for those who just tuned in, I'm Freddie Francis and I'm a trainee with the DASH cluster. Um, so welcome to the UBC Data Science and Health Invite Lecture Series, um, led by Drs. Anita Palepu and Teresa Sang. UBC Data Science and Health Cluster is working to harmonize health data access in BC. DASH envisions the development of a harmonized data ecosystem that can accommodate multimodal and multidimensional data. Their members are applying data science to health research to improve diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of diseases. So, um, so big thank you uh, from the DASH um, and on behalf of DASH for those who are attending. And without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce Dr. Leo Selly, um, our speaker for this afternoon. Um, as a clinical researcher, director, and principal research scientist at the MIT Laboratory for Computational Physiology, 
and as a practicing medicine intensive care unit physician at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Leo brings together clinicians and data scientists to support research using data routinely collected in the process of care. His group built and maintains the publicly available medical information marked for intensive care database and the Philips MIT EICU collaborative research database with more than 25,000 users from around the world. In addition, Leo is one of the course directors for HST 936 titled Global Health Informatics to Improve Quality of Care and HST 953 titled Collaborative Data Science in Medicine, both at MIT. He is an editor of the textbook for each course, both released under an open access license. Secondary analysis of electronic health records has been downloaded more than a million times and has been translated to Mandarin, Spanish, Korean, and Portuguese. He is also the inaugural editor of PLOS Digital Help. So a warm welcome to Dr. Leo Celli. And I will, without further ado, hand over the um, screen to him. And off to you, doctor. Thanks, Freddie. It's great to be in Vancouver. Not, I'm here in Boston. Um, unfortunately, cannot join the folks there at, uh, at UBC, but maybe sometime next year, uh, an in-person presentation, an in-person uh, in -person event would be possible. And I'm just going to share my slide deck. Uh, thanks again for the introduction, uh, Freddie. Um, I am still a practicing clinician. I work in the intensive care unit here in uh, Boston, Massachusetts at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center which is the home of the Boston Red Sox and of Mimic. Uh, research is based here at MIT, and this is uh, on the application of data science in the healthcare domain. Before I proceed, I wanted to um, acknowledge that our group receives research funding from the National Institute of Health, as well as several industry partners. I represent a, uh, a MIT Critical Data. It's a global consortium whose mission is putting data and learning at the front and center of healthcare. The consortium consists of healthcare practitioners, computer scientists, engineers, and social scientists who believe that data and learning are the best medicine for population health. We build communities across disciplines to derive knowledge from data routinely collected in the process of care in order to understand health and disease better and in the local context. The consortium is led by our laboratory here at MIT the Laboratory for Computational Physiology. The flagship project is the MIMIC database. Uh, MIMIC stands for Medical Information Mart for Intensive Care. And it was the first resource of this kind, developed and maintained over the past two decades now by our group. The database is now in its fourth iteration as MIMIC4. It contains high resolution and multimodal de-identified data from the electronic health records uh, associated with patients admitted to Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center uh, here in Boston. And the data include, but are not limited to, vital sign recordings and waveforms, laboratory data, clinical notes, diagnostic reports, medical images, and administered interventions, including medications. In addition to MIMIC, uh, our group also partnered with Philips to release the identified data from the Philips EICU Research Institute. The EICU Collaborative Research Database is a multi-center critical care database with data from more than 200,000 ICU admissions from across the United States that were archived from the Philips ICU telehealth platform. Um, long believing that open access to data spurs innovation and accelerates progress, our group makes MIMIC and the EICU CRD publicly available to any individual who completes a standard course on human subject research and signs a data use agreement. In doing so, this data have allowed for countless projects in academia and industry, and the availability of MIMIC has made the BIDMC ICU population the most intensely studied critically ill cohort to date. This is, Beth Israel has become the Framingham of ICU. In addition, the data use agreement for both databases requires that the codes for the projects be publicly shared after publication. This has led to the rapid development of reusable concepts in the respective codes and queries in the repositories. The availability of this code accelerates research and promotes reproducibility 
by ensuring that common concepts are implemented consistently across studies. I wanted to start off with the grand vision of our group. And that objective is to redraw the world's very unequal knowledge map. So the questions for you uh, are, how are treatment guidelines established in healthcare? How do doctors in Asia know what medications to prescribe for diabetes? How do medical residents in Africa know how to treat sepsis in their ICUs? The answer is these guidelines are coming from the medical knowledge system. And the medical knowledge system is informed by research that is performed in a few rich countries. Let's start with clinical trials. So clinical trials, as people here know, um, are the gold standard for uh, establishing evidence-based medicine uh, treatment guidelines. In 1997, uh, what we do know is that 92% of people who participate in clinical trials were white. This improved somewhat to 2014. Um, it, it dropped to 86%. Clearly there's some improvement, but not enough improvement. Note that as of 2015, 75% of the population live in Asia or Africa, and very few of those people uh, participate in these clinical trials. More recently, there has been an uptick in the number of low and middle income countries participating in clinical trials, but for all the wrong reasons. This is an editorial from a couple of weeks ago, and I quote, despite reduced complexity and lower costs being commonly cited reasons for pharma's motivation, in running cancer drug trials in low and middle income countries, there is another incentive, the possibility of running a trial with a substandard control arm that would not be considered ethical in a high income country. After clinical trials, observational studies uh, inform the treatment guidelines and protocols that are implemented around the world. And by far the most influential in observational study is the Framingham Heart Study. It has been uh, going on for over 70 years now. It's enrolled more than 15,000 participants. And these are people who live in Framingham, Massachusetts. It's produced close to 4,000 papers, but the biggest problem there is that almost 100% of the people who live in Framingham, Massachusetts are white. Let's put that into context. Let's look at hypertension. In the United States, Blacks have the highest prevalence of hypertension, about 45%, versus 33% for the white uh, cohort. And yet, treatments and standards of care for hypertension are based on studies of middle-aged white males. This is a fascinating landmark study published in 1986. It is called the Multiple Risk Factor Intervention Trial, or Mr. Fit for short. It enrolled 356,222 men in the US. And at the time of publication, the study constituted the largest cohort uh, with serum cholesterol and long-term mortality follow-up. It subsequently shaped how heart disease is treated around the world. And again, just to point it out, in case you didn't notice, this consists of 356,222 men participating in the study. So what happens, what sort of outcomes do we get when the medical knowledge system disproportionately represents the white male population? Here is a study uh, done on more, nearly 80,000 patients from more than 400 hospitals. And they found that women having heart attacks die more often than men after admission to the hospital and after adjusting for disease severity and other confounders. Will outcomes improve with precision medicine using genomics or artificial intelligence? Not if precision medicine research is saddled with the same issues as clinical trials. A 2016 Nature paper found that in genomics, 87% of participants in worldwide genomics research were of European descent. In the United States, people of African descent only accounted for 3% of genomics data and Hispanics weighed in at half a percentage point, despite making up 13% and 18% of the US population respectively. And everyone is excited with artificial intelligence transforming uh, healthcare delivery. 
This is a chart showing the investments going into healthcare AI in 2020. And this is not reflected by this graph. Amazon, Google, Apple, and Microsoft have collectively invested $3.7 billion into healthcare AI. Do we have evidence that AI is improving health, health outcomes? Far from it. This is the first message that I want people to take away from this talk. Uh, the, this, uh, it's patenting and selling AI algorithms in healthcare will do more harm than good. And I hope that in 15 minutes, everyone in this group will be convinced that this is not the way to go. And let's look at several examples. At the beginning of the pandemic in 2020, Epic accelerated the deployment of a clinical prediction tool called the Deterioration Index. The index is poised to upend a key cultural practice in medicine, that of triaging. Triaging is an act of determining how sick a patient is at any given moment to prioritize treatment. In the past, clinicians have performed this task by rapidly interpreting a patient's vital signs, physical exam findings, test results, and other data points using heuristics learned through years of on-the-job medical training. The company identified an index of 70 and more or, or higher with significant risk of deterioration. So again, there was a push to implement this uh, algorithm at the start of the pandemic in March and April 2020. A few months later, a group looked at the performance of this algorithm and using real world data. So this paper comes from uh, the group at University of Michigan. It was published around December, I believe of 2020. And they did confirm that an index of 70 or more had a 74 probability of experiencing deterioration. However, the sensitivity was 39%. So it missed about 60% of people who had clinical deterioration. The authors concluded that the clinical use of the index as an early warning system is limited by its low sensitivity. The deployment of a proprietary algorithm into clinical practice with minimal understanding of the potential unintended consequences for patients or clinicians raises a host of issues. Let's go to, to example number two. Um, this pertains to an algorithm, again, proprietary that FDA cleared and implemented at hundreds of hospitals in the United States. Called the Epic Sepsis model, the tool is included as part of Epic's electronic health record platform. According to the company, it calculates and indicates the probability of a likelihood of sepsis to help clinicians identify hard to spot cases. The same group of researchers, they might have something against Epic, uh, found that the output of the model to be substantially worse than what was reported by the vendor when applied to a large retrospective sample of more than 27,000 adult Michigan medicine patients. And the tool only identified 7% of patients with sepsis that were missed by a clinician. It also did not identify 67% of patients with sepsis despite generating alerts on 18% of all the hospitalized patients thus creating a large burden of alert fatigue. The third example comes from Google. It's a good illustration of what could go wrong when an algorithm is developed without adequate input from the end users. Google Health created a deep learning system looking at images of the eye and looking for evidence of diabetic retinopathy, a leading cause of vision loss around the world. But despite a very high theoretical accuracy in the lab, the tools proved impractical in real world testing, frustrating both patients and nurses with inconsistent results and a general lack of harmony with on the ground practices. This paper documents a deployment of the tool meant to augment the existing process by which patients at several clinics in Thailand are screened for diabetic retinopathy. The system was intended to provide ophthalmologist-like expertise within seconds. In internal tests, it identified degrees of diabetic retinopathy with more than 90% accuracy. The nurses could then make a preliminary recommendation for referral or further testing within a minute instead of the usual one month. However, the deep learning system has stringent guidelines regarding the images it will assess. 
If an image has a bit of a blur or a dark area, for instance, the system will reject it, even if it could make a strong prediction. The system's high standards for image quality is at odds with the consistency and quality of images that the nurses were routinely capturing under the constraints of the clinic, and this mismatch caused frustration and added work. Here's why we think we might be on track to fail with regard to improving health outcomes using artificial intelligence. First, the ground truth that we use to evaluate model accuracy is not fair. Real world data is rife with health inequities. So training algorithms with real world data will permanently ingrain the disparities in patient outcomes. Second, we are trying to solve the problems with the same people who have the same mindset as those who created and perpetuated these problems in the first place. Those who are charting the course of science, those who are charting the course of medicine, the ones sitting at the table are either ivory tower academics or ITAs, or those who were trained by ivory tower academics or the TITAs. Everyone else, including most of the world is on the menu. The only way to break the cycle of health disparities is to diversify those at the table. This preprint publication shown here is our biggest contribution to AI in healthcare research so far. In this paper, uh, we were able to demonstrate that it's easy to train computers to uh, learn to identify the self-reported race of a medical image without giving it any clinical data. So just showing it an X-ray or an MRI, uh, it could easily learn whether that X-ray or MRI belongs to a white patient or a non-white patient. It's able to do this, uh, this classification even when you are training the algorithm for other clinical tasks in classification or prediction. And these results were uh, able to be generalized across various uh, external validation sets from different hospitals, as well as in different medical imaging modalities, such as x-rays, CAT scans, and MRIs. So why do we care that computers can identify sensitive attributes such as race, ethnicity, or gender, or other demographics, even when these information are scrubbed from data sets? That brings us to the story of this force called Clever Hands. Clever Hands was an Arab stallion from Russia. In the 1900s, he was purchased by Wilhelm von Austin, a retired schoolmaster. And he was kind of bored at that time after retirement. He decided that he would teach the horse how to recognize the numbers one to nine and how to perform simple calculations such as addition and subtraction. He was so impressed with Clever Hands that he started having road shows with people uh, witnessing the genius of the horse. But it turned out that the horse was actually not recognizing the numbers or even performing the calculation. The horse was detecting the heartbeat of Von Austin and the audience. Every time Von Austin would point to the right answer, he gets excited, the audience gets excited, the horse gets the signal and would indicate that that is the answer. So they did some experiments where they did not tell Von Austin what the question is. They did not tell the audience uh, what the question is. There's another set of audience that's uh, a little bit further away that would know. Uh, and it turned out that Clever Hans was not so clever at all. He did not get any of the answers right. So are there examples of Clever Hans in machine learning? Absolutely. In this work from University of Washington and UC Irvine, the investigators trained a computer vision algorithm to distinguish wolves from huskies. All the images of wolves had snow in the background, while none of the huskies were photographed with snow. And as expected, the algorithm picked this up and learned from the background and not from the animal features. This can happen too if computers can identify the patient race or the patient gender or whether the patient is morbidly obese or whether the patient has mental health problems and use that information for classification or prediction instead of the relevant features. It has been more than five years. It was 2016 
when this ProPublica investigative report on machine uh, bias was published, and it definitely jarred the machine learning community. But since 2016, all we have accomplished is understanding how difficult it is to prevent AI from perpetuating societal biases in algorithms. When a sensitive attribute such as race ethnicity is learned even when deliberately removed from a data set, then it is not far-fetched to think that algorithms would also pick up provider bias and subjectivity in decision-making. After all, algorithms are trained on data that document clinical intuition and judgment encoded as decisions that contribute to outcome disparities across race, gender, and other demographic factors. We need a better roadmap to leverage the value of machine learning and derive knowledge from the zettabytes of health data we collect in the process of care. And that roadmap can only be built by a more diverse research community. The next few slides, I'll just gonna go over some of the projects that our group is involved in. The first is actually a collection of projects called uh, the Dashboard Project. And through this initiative, what we're hoping to do is to provide some real-time tracker of what, how diverse are the research communities behind AI in healthcare, global health, fairness in healthcare. Are we improving the gender balance? Are we seeing more countries that are contributing publications in these areas? Is the fairness community fair? Do they have the gra gravitas to decide what is fair and what are the metrics for fairness? Um, this is the pipeline that we have adopted in terms of being able to identify the papers within a particular subject area. We're using um, algorithms to uh, identify the gender. So there are open, act, open source algorithms out there for gender identification and for our race ethnicity uh, identification. And of course, uh, we would like to see which universities, which countries are represented in, uh, in, in the publication world. So for AI in healthcare, what we learned very quickly is that this is dominated by oncology. Uh, you could see here the, uh, the different topics uh, that have been uh, focused on by different papers uh, using machine learning. And it's among the, uh, among the omics, it's radiomics that is uh, dominating AI. So radiomics pertain to uh, abnormalities on uh, medical imaging uh, and using that for classification or for uh, phenotyping or for uh, prediction or prognostication. And these are the countries contributing to AI in healthcare literature. As you could see, very few countries are represented and this is not acceptable. We know that the burden of disease is so much higher in other parts of the world outside of the United States and we need more voices. We need more representation in AI in healthcare literature. This is the second project that I want to highlight. This is a collaboration between IBM, our group, University of uh, Virginia, uh, Virginia Tech University, um, as well as uh, friends and collaborators from around the world. And this is called the Chest Image Gnome Dataset. Um, the purpose of this data set is to provide a resource to the research community that will allow us to train algorithms how to read uh, medical images the way radiologists actually learn. So it's not just putting all the images in some autoencoder and then transformer and then figuring out uh, the probability of certain labels. For this particular data set, what we did was to create 242,000 richly labeled scene graphs for images from the MIMIC chest X-ray data set. The graphs are labeled with up to 29 objects, 76 clinical attributes, and 4.9 million relations. The objective is to support more explainable medical imaging research using this data set. The inspiration, of course, comes from the visual genome where they have uh, put together 108,000 manually labeled natural images. 
and the annotation was performed by around 33,000 Amazon Turks. And as you can see here, uh, the different uh, parts of the images are mapped to different concepts. And that's what we did with the chess image gnome data set. The first component of the scene graph is the object to attribute relations. An object in the chess image gnome data set depicts an anatomical region on the chess x-ray. An attribute is a finding, a disease, or a device that an object has or does not have. For example, here the object, the right lung, has a chest tube in it. Altogether, there are 4.3 million su such object to attribute relations in the data set. On top of that, we have embedded parent to child and child to parent relations in each graph. So that should future researchers want to model with graph neural networks, relevant messages can be passed appropriately. The next component of the scene graphs is the idea of questions. We have sectioned out sentences from the history or reason for the exam sections of the radiology reports. And the sentences contain information and questions from the bedside clinicians for the radiologists and comprise the remainder of the scene graph. So questions such as, where does an attribute belong? Does an object have an attribute? Is attribute one related to attribute two mapped to the same object? These are just some starting questions to reason about clinical disease processes in an anatomically aware manner. The third project that I wanted to showcase is an initiative between our group, several uh, colleagues and friends from other parts of the United States, including Arizona State University, Emory University, um, as well as friends and collaborators from Colombia and from Taiwan. For this particular project, the intent is to learn from changes in satellite images, which are now very ubiquitous. As you know, satellite images are being uh, photographed of uh, the same municipalities around the world. And you could learn from the changes happening within a certain location and see whether that is useful for classification, prediction, or optimization. For this particular project, we're hoping to include information uh, gathered from the satellite images, the series of satellite images pertaining to a municipality in predicting whether there will be an increase, decrease uh, in the number of dengue cases. And we feel that this is gonna be useful for any vector-borne illnesses. So the modeling is divided into two. The first part is using contrastive learning to represent the images and use that as input for a, an LSTM or an RNN to help us uh, to be able to predict the number of dengue cases two or four weeks from, uh, from, from this time. And the idea there is to for inform health policy uh, folks um, uh, in terms of resource allocation and to uh, warn them against upcoming um, outbreaks, for example, of dengue based on some drastic changes in the satellite images. The fourth project is called the LIMIC dataset. Uh, as you could see, this is a uh, takeoff of the MIMIC dataset. LIMIC stands for Learning Information Mart for, informa for Informal Experiential STEM Learning and Career Development. Uh, we are uh, aggregating data collected as students use a software to, uh, that they use for informal STEM um, events such as camps or workshops and de-identify them the same way that we identified electronic health records from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and hopefully attract the machine learning community to uh, engage in precision education research. Um, so it's an open access relational de-identified scalable database designed to support research on how career-oriented informal experiential learning opportunities for K through 12 students are implemented and how to assess and enhance them. And this is uh, a project of several groups that are uh, collaborating for this uh, initiative. That includes uh, ACERN, which is an ed tech startup that developed the, the Scout Layer application that we're using for this data set. 
um, East Bay Education Collaborative, a nonprofit providing STEM and professional development resources to high school students. Turk, which is a research and development nonprofit focused on STEM education and the Tampa Bay STEM Network, an organization dedicated to enhance and expand STEM rich opportunities in Tampa Bay, Florida. This project was inspired by an interest in representing and understanding how students learn by exploring and analyzing the digital traces of learning at the student level and identifying best practices in the way evidence-based medicine is generated using real-world electronic health records. The initiative is analogous to how fundamental transformation of healthcare is being driven by opening up electronic health records through large inclusive databases and making them accessible to companies, researchers, and healthcare practitioners. This is one of the um, data, the dashboard project. In this particular dashboard, what we're looking at are the investigators that are using open access data sets versus data sets where the access is limited to internal investigators. And what we found is that open access data sets definitely promote research diversity. This is just one of the findings of this project. Uh, this is representing the proportion of women who are publishing off uh, traditional data sets. And those are the ones where they're only accessible to internal investigators. As you could see here, it's been flat at about uh, 0.21 uh, or, or 0.22. Uh, compared to the publications uh, arising from MIMIC and EICU, Collaborative Research Database, and MIMIC Chess X-ray, Chexpert, and there you could definitely see a higher proportion of women and that proportion is increasing over time. So we think that uh, another value of making data sets open is that you're able to uh, recruit uh, more people whose voices need to be heard in the way we're performing research. And in, uh, in connection with trying to improve the gender balance of people involved in data science. We have been working with the women in data science. We've supported the Datathon. We've provided them with the data sets for the women in data science Datathon in 2020 and 2021. And here you could just see the exponential rise in the number of teams participating in these Datathons, as well as the number of countries who are engaged uh, with us in terms of analyzing uh, the, the data that we have. And we're attracting not just the ivory tower academics or those who train under the ivory tower academics. Definitely there are more beginners, people who have no prior experience with healthcare data that are, being, that are attracted to uh, these initiatives with the goal of improving the way we deliver healthcare. And finally, uh, I just wanted to plug our new journal, so Plus Digital Health. The idea here is that uh, the main objective is really to diversify uh, the, the research community. We're definitely trying to recruit more submissions from low and middle income countries, for, from uh, researchers who don't normally publish their work. We're hoping that this provides a good platform so uh, we urge you to consider submitting your, uh, your articles, your manuscripts first to Plus Digital Health uh, before you consider uh, other uh, journals. So I'm gonna try to wrap the, the, the session. I, I presented a lot of problems and I don't really have the solutions to all those problems that I, uh, that I introduced today. However, I am certain that algorithms developed by teams with perspectives that underrepresent most of the world are bound to maintain the status quo. We should not only invest in storage and compute technologies and federated learning platform or synthetic data generation. Our goal should be to build capacity across populations and diversity of perspectives in research. This is the biggest investment we can make to equity to uh, prioritize equity. On that note, we introduce a new school of thought in research, village mentoring and hive learning. Our group has created an interconnected meshwork of experts, not just across countries, but across various cultural contexts. 
The network has developed into a web of students and teachers whose goal is to learn together and from each other. The problems we are trying to address is structural inequities, a medical knowledge system that disproportionately represents a majoritized few, are the same problems we faced in the previous century. We cannot solve them with the same strategies that created them in the first place. The idea that a single group with a narrow range of skills can have an impact is both arrogant and ignorant. We need to break down the silos across disciplines, across populations, and leverage each other's expertise, experiences, and perspective. I want to end with one of my favorite quotes. If you don't have a seat at the table, you are probably on the menu. And on that note, it is time to build a much larger table and forget about the menu, forget about eating. Instead, let us learn together. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Amazing. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shelley. Um, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself or put up your hand and maybe I can call on uh, in order to ask your questions. We do prefer that you ask your questions verbally so we can hear and see you and uh, have a lively conversation. I am not seeing any hands up yet. Um, so if you are wanting to ask a question, please feel free to unmute. Otherwise, we could proceed okay. with okay. just comparing what's the last movie that you saw. <laughs> actually, I, I, I really enjoyed your talk, uh, Dr. Sally. Um, I'm actually in the middle of reading uh, Deep Medicine, uh, the book by Dr. Uh, Eric. Eric, Eric, yeah, Coppola. Um, and so it, 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 was the, it was a philosophical side. I was trying to connect all the new updates that you were giving. So it was very informative and very interesting. Um, so maybe because you're in the interface of data and um, healthcare, because you're an active physician, um, how, where do you see uh, the transformative uh, outcomes of AI that are you know, properly trained, properly investigated and put into a tool um, intersecting with healthcare? Are there examples of uh, these AI transformative tools already in healthcare that physicians are using, especially in the emergency department? Um, or where, where are we? No, we're, we're not there yet. Uh, we're, okay. we're far from having something that is mature. Um, one of my aspiration is to create AI that would alert me if I'm having some unconscious bias in the decision that I'm making. I think that would be a very valuable tool. Uh, again, this is not cancel culture. This is not calling out. I think we need to be honest and uh, accept the fact that we are humans. We have all these uh, unconscious biases. Sometimes as a doctor, I feel like perhaps I'm seeing the color of the skin or I'm getting maybe annoyed by a family member or maybe you're hearing the accent of the dad and that's coloring the way uh, you make decisions. And it would be great if AI would tell me that, hey, if this patient were of another color or another age, would that be, would you be making a similar decision? Because look at this, uh, based on uh, what we know that this could be uh, somehow, this decision might be laced with features that are not relevant to this particular decision. So that's, that is one of the things that I dream about in terms of where would be a very valuable uh, contribution of AI is to alert me uh, whether the decision I'm making is objective or not. Um, it will be great if this can I, be identified uh, automatically. So one of the projects that I did not mention is looking for negative sentiments uh, based on the notes that are being written by the doctors and the nurses and whether you could use that to, uh, again, not to out someone as being racist. Uh, we are not here to shame the healthcare community. I'm part of that healthcare community. And I would like to know if I'm making biased decisions, if I'm contributing to the structural inequities. And uh, perhaps there are, there are traces of these um, unconscious biases and uh, we can be uh, alerted, we could be triggered. Um, by 
by, by such decisions. So it, it's very interesting. We're using natural language processing and seeing whether we could detect this. And the problem there, there there's not a lot of examples uh, and that's, that's to be expected. We don't want to sound sexist or racist or, or biased against our morbidly obese patients or alcoholic patients. Uh, but we are finding examples and we're using some uh, fancy machine learning, uh, few shot learning, zero shot learning, so that even if the computer has not seen a specific example in the future, so it wasn't part of the training set, uh, it would identify that this is indeed a negative sentiment on the part of the provider. Yeah, I mean, that it, that is a dream, um, but it's hard to um, think about how that would happen. So thank you. Um, I will call on uh, an, another person who has the hand up. I think Farouk had, has the hand up. Nope, not anymore. Um, I will call on Anita. Dr. Blav Anita, yes. So Anita. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for such an interesting uh, and provocative and important presentation for all of us to hear. I'm curious as to how do we get around... Um, our primary data deficit, as you say, in terms of representation and inclusion for a lot of the, the health problems that we see, because largely what is being researched is often sort of so-called first world, European, North American, high income country disease, when in fact, the global burden of disease isn't entirely uh, in these countries. So there, there's just by nature, because of the incentives of how we deliver healthcare and, and resource distribution and political power, there are these disparities there. So it's kind of like, um, in a way, garbage in, garbage out to some extent. So yeah, it, I, I find this fundamentally a big challenge um, in terms of wanting to make a bigger impact. Um, so just, yeah, I would, I'd be curious to hear your reflections on that because it's a huge equity issue that I think a lot of people probably on this uh, Zoom call think about too. So I, I'd love to hear because I know you've thought a lot about it. So thank you. Yeah. So I think the first step is to somehow change the composition of academia, change the composition of people who are in the editorial boards, change the, change the composition of people who decide where the funding goes. So the NIH, the NHS, Wellcome Trust, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So people, because th these are very powerful organizations and they have, they have, we have contributed to the problem. So we have created the problem. We have perpetuated the problems and we need to own it. So that's the first step. And there has to be more efforts. And when I say diversify, it's important to define what diversity is. So we've coined the phrase diverse in appearance only. You would see a lot of organizations where uh, you have representations of different uh, gender and race ethnicity, but they think alike. They were all coming from Ivy, Ivory Tower, Ivy League institutions or trained by those people who, who train in those institutions. And we really have to make a concerted effort to enrich our team by people who don't think like us, because that to me is the reason why for the longest time, this research projects have been funded and have been published is because the, the people at the top don't see the problems. And I think we need to start really with revamping the, the biomedical research enterprise, revamping academia. And of course, that's hard. There's going to be a lot of pushback against that. I, I remember uh, when I was trying to convince the rest of the group at PLOS that we really have to have stronger uh, incentives to bring in the non-traditional uh, research players. And one of the comments uh, that I heard, which really annoyed me, was the statement that we, we don't wanna lower the standards of publication just so uh, we will have more voices. And I, I mean, I got pissed. Like those standards are put together by us to keep everyone else out, to make this an exclusive country club. And we, we love the power. We love to show off that we, we know what's best for the rest of the world. So people are gonna hold on to power and there's gonna be a pushback. 
But I think the critical moment is now. I'm, I'm quite optimistic that this is finally going to happen. I mean, it's aligning with the Me Too movement, with the Black Lives movement. There's definitely more um, projects coming from the NH, NIH, the NHS, the aim ahead, where they really want to uh, solicit more data sets from historically Black and college institutions and Hispanic serving institutions. And they're not going to give the money again to the Harvard School of Public Health and, and the London School of Economics. So there, there are definitely more efforts, and those are, uh, those, those are music to our ears. But I think it needs to begin with uh, bringing in more people at the table so that we, we don't feast uh, on, on others when we start uh, allocating uh, funds and allocating uh, priorities for when it comes to research. Wow, oh, thank you, yes, um, true, amazing. Um, thank you so much. I have Wayna uh, on for the next question. Please send me yourself. Oh yeah, thank you so much, Professor Sadi, for your wonderful presentation. I'm very impressed by your statement on the clinical evidence. So I have uh, uh, maybe a thought, a question on the AI and the clinical evidence, the relationship between the two. So do you think AI can become a kind of another layer of evidence-based medicine and uh, whether and how we can incorporate into the AI into the, our clinical evidence? Yeah, I mean, the, I don't know how many clinicians are here, but in general, uh, we apply our own personal AI already <laughs> in the way mm -hmm. we make decisions, right? Because clinical trials, as you know, are only providing you average treatment effect. And we also know that in that clinical trial, there were a lot of people who got excluded and who were not even uh, evaluated as candidate for the trial. And as you know, there's a lot of sampling selection bias uh, that, are, that is involved with these clinical trials. So as a clinician, you always look at the results of a clinical trial and then you recalibrate that uh, depending on your understanding of the clinical situation as well as of the patient. What we want is to partner with the computers because it turns out that the way we recalibrate uh, understanding of evidence-based medicine, the way we look at evidence is itself very uh, much subject to biases. So perhaps by teaming up with computers, who can maybe more objectively uh, do this for us. And of course, that's a big if, because if we train those computers using the digital traces of, uh, of healthcare delivery, then there's no hope. And this is why I always say that we have to move away from accuracy as the metric with which we, um, we evaluate algorithms, because if that's the case, we're doomed. Because every disparity that we see now is going to be perpetuated like the, the, uh, the marginalized populations are always going to continue to have poor outcomes and there's going to be a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy there. They're, you're you're going to prognosticate that they're not going to do well. You're not going to offer them chemotherapy. And then we're, we're no better than we were uh, before AI. So to me, um, I, I think that this is going to, the, to be the way forward, that uh, there will be a lot of mixing of AI with, I'm not going to say that cl clinical trials should be discontinued, uh, far from it. I think clinical trials have also, have also should be uh, complemented, augmented by AI. So there are discussions of uh, what we call platform trials. Platform trials are perpetual trials. You never end it. You continuously uh, randomize people based on what is the effect size at that time, given a set of uh, priors. And then the randomization is affected by how big or how, or how small the effect size at that point in time. And it never ends because as you know, the effect size is gonna change as the uh, practice patterns evolve, as new treatments are introduced uh, some medication might be effective now, but somewhere down the road, it's no longer effective. And that's one of the flaws of clinical trials is that you don't repeat clinical trials every three years to determine whether you still get the same effect size. With AI though, you can, there is this audit trail. You could continuously monitor 
how well they are in terms of their effectiveness, and more importantly, what is the impact of that AI algorithm on disparities? So what we're pushing for is that there should be a disparity dashboard. Every time an AI is implemented, you will see whether are there more black babies still dying from the uh, neonatal ICU compared to white babies? Are there more Hispanic mothers dying, dying from childbirth? We think that that should be a part of the continuous monitoring of AI algorithms after they are deployed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think Delron has a question. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, just thank you so much for the amazing talk. I really enjoyed it. And I, like, it's so refreshing to hear uh, an expert like yourself make those uh, bold and, in my opinion, very true uh, statements. So thank you for that. Um, uh, my question is sort of a follow up to Anita's question. Um, so you mentioned things that can be done uh, require, require some like fundamental change in terms of how funds are allocated um, in order to get to that like true, uh, well, truly accountable way of doing the this AI research. So, and and then like you said, people that are uh, maybe higher up in those in those roles, they might not be as hands on, and they might not be aware of the the, de the detail level of the the issues here. So my question for you is, for us. Uh, say the, like I'm, I'm a technically still a trainee, um, uh, and for the next sort of next generation of research researchers and data scientists, what can we do like beyond just trying to do our own research with honesty and integrity? Is there anything that we can do at our level to kind of help with that shift that needs to happen, like in this enterprise? Yeah, there, there, there's actually a lot. Um... Some of them are more easily done than the others. Let's start with the ones that are more easily done. Um, before you even start uh, creating visualizations of the data, I think the homework should be, so for example, if you're gonna be using the Mimic data set, your homework should be which populations are marginalized in the ICU. So which populations have worse outcomes? that is not explained by patient factors. Uh, and you need to do that homework. And then what are the drivers of those disparities? And included in that homework is finding out, are there people who don't even get into the data set? So are there people who die at home because they don't even reach the hospitals? Because that creates a sampling selection bias. And as you know, that would lead to spurious associations, like all sorts of weird associations. And it's because of sampling selection bias. Um, so definitely we emphasize this to the students to do their due diligence in understanding. Um, it's very true. We're working with transplant list data sets, and you know that some people don't even get listed to the transplant. So before you, you uh, try to do your exploratory data analysis, you need to understand how were people filtered out and how were people, how did people got into the data set? Because Without that understanding, you're, you're, not, you're gonna be blindsided. You won't see where the, the biases are. So I think every one of us should do that before you even look at the, the UK biobank that you want to work with. You have to understand where are the disparities and outcomes from diabetic retinopathy. Um, and to me, having that mindset, would, we're, we're already several steps ahead if every data scientist uh, would do that before they submit a paper to NeurIPS or KDD or triple AI, it's almost like it should be part, and we're thinking about that actually. So as you know, for Mimic, we require you to undergo or to, um, to have an online course on human subject research. We're thinking of putting together an online course on uh, machine bias and health disparities that we will require everyone who is asking for access to one of our data sets. Um, I, I could see so many pushback, like when, when we try to do this, oh, we might be discriminating against people, like, come on. <laughs> I, I, I think we have to, to, to do that extra step to ensure that the output of the Mimic data set would truly move the needle in terms of improving health outcomes. Thank you very much. One okay. more minute. 
Yes, um, and I don't see uh, any questions. And uh, maybe I'll ask a quick one. Um, what do you see personalized medicine fit into this AI picture? So I, I heard you talk about clinical trials as this population level effect that we can't discern to you know minute differences that we may see uh, where we're doing these trials. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have a thought on per quick minute thought on personalized medicine and AI. I think personalized medicine is going to come from the marriage of machine learning and causal inference and using any type of data from genomics to metabolomics to radiomics and leveraging all that data because it's pointless. Like, why are we just using clinical data? And one thing to add is we need to start really putting uh, details about social determinants. So race, ethnicity is not enough because you cannot lump all the Hispanics together or all the Blacks together. One of our efforts now is to map every mimic patient to a social vulnerability index. So everyone has an address and every address is linked to a social vulnerability index based on the census uh, survey that is being done every couple of years. And I think that's a great idea. Everyone who's trying to create a data set should include at least a social vulnerability index, which needs to be recalibrated according to the outcomes that you're trying to classify or predict. Um, but to me, this is where it has to head to so that we would see less and less disparities is using all the data that we have, using the methodologies from the machine learning community and the causal inference community joined together. They need to start working together. Uh, and as I said, I'm, I'm actually optimistic that this is going to happen. Uh, before I used to end my talk by saying that don't ever get sick, stay away from the hospitals. That is the only way that you could be guaranteed of good outcomes. But maybe in a few years time, uh, I would change my mind in terms of uh, how to end my talks. Wow, that's very optimistic and uh, that's, that's very uplifting to hear as a trainee as well. So uh, thank you. I'll take this uh, opportunity to thank you, Dr. Sally, and uh, thank you for sharing your insights and your presentation and all the work that you have done. It was uh, extremely entertaining and you know very informative for trainees and I'm sure everyone else as well. Um, so I want to take again uh, to extend the thanks from the, the audience and uh, the Dash cluster um, and uh, everyone uh, who wants to pass on their thanks. So um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks, buddy.